I'm Rick Edelman. Today, we're going to take you back in time, a conversation with actor and director Chaz Palminteri, the guy who's passionate about the Bronx streets where he grew up and about staying in control of his finances. Plus, the timeless art of hand-rolled cigars, how to build your kid's credit rating and paying off student loans. We've got it all right here on The Truth About Money. best-selling author and founder of one of the nation's largest financial planning firms, Rick Edelman. It's such a caricature, a rich, fat banker lighting up a big, fat cigar and using $20 bills to do it. At upwards of 40 bucks a piece, hand-rolled cigars are not only bad for your health, they're bad for your wealth. But they're still around, and so we sent financial educator Keith Spengel to Key West to get the story behind special stogies. What I seem to notice uh, around the area is everybody's talking about hand-rolled cigars. Well, what we mean by hand-rolled is actually being rolled here. And what's what's your roller's name back there? Raul. Raul, Raul and Saul. Between him and his brother have 90 years of experience rolling cigars. So they roll their own blend. Uh, it's a Nicaraguan Dominican blend with a Connecticut wrapper. Okay. Uh, they also do a Maduro and a Twist. Can you explain to our viewers a little bit more about the flavoring of those wrappers? Uh, the Connecticut wrap uh, basically is, is a wrapper that's shade grown in Connecticut. It tends to be very mild. You have a Maduro wrap, which is direct sun, uh, which is going to have more pepper, more spice, more bold flavor okay. to the palate. You, you can get cigars from grape, mango, chocolate, mocha wrappers. Because I'm wondering, the, the real cigar aficionados, do they turn their nose up in the air for the flavored cigars? They're like, no, nah, that's that's kitty stuff. Pretty much, pretty much. Cigars rolled from bottom open to top closed and capped and glued with a... Glued? Like glue glue? It's like a yucca paste. That is the yucca. That's the yucca, OK. It's all natural. They make it into a paste, and then they, gotcha. they seal it. It is an art. How many cigars would he be making? 700 to 1500 a week. Your price ranges from, I think you said all the way down to $6. $595 upwards of between $40 and $50. And what would make it that $40 or $50? The aging process and the quality of the cigar. Cigar is, you know, more of an in thing than a cigarette today. So typically, uh, you know, people come for special occasions. It's the wedding. It's, you know, somebody's having a baby. What's maybe the strangest request you've had? I mean, Key West, so strange. To get me to strange see something as strange is, here is normal. West, right? So, yes. Well, Rick, had a great afternoon here at the Key West Cigar Club. Now, I can't say that smoking a cigar is good for you. But I can say it's not a bad way to spend an afternoon. Oh, come on. She was a prop. <laughs> we, no, she wanted us to, to shoot her. She wanted to be part of your show. She's She was a customer happily smoking oh, cigars. Oh, yeah, no, if you go back to the shot, there's a bunch of people, that, that's what they do down there. You walk by any of these hand-rolling shops, and they're just hanging out all afternoon, enjoying their cigars, talking about the weather. And looking about... forward to the reservations of the nearest emergency room when they're dealing with all the carcinogens and... As I said, I couldn't say that it was healthy for you, but getting a hand-rolled cigar you're also getting something that's a little more pure. Uh, you're getting the leaves that are either from the East Coast. It had glue in it. It was yucca paste, as I was told <laughs> quite clearly. Yeah, I know. It's As I said, it, it's not healthy for you, but uh, the more pure ones, the ones that are hand-rolled like that, uh, you're getting a, a little bit better experience. Uh, I didn't say that. As so, it was said on camera, I didn't inhale. It's... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, not too. You didn't look like you were enjoying yourself too much, Keith. <laughs> so I, I guess the notion of doing them for celebrations, I remember as a little kid, breaking out the cigar because someone had a baby, that was the thing to do. And, I'm, you know, I'm glad that you brought that up. It actually goes back to tradition from the early 1700s that cigars and getting this tobacco leaf uh, were very, very hard to come by. So when someone were to have a birth of a child, it was a celebration of not only the child but also the mother making it through the birth. So it was inviting people to enjoy a cigar with me, let's enjoy the experience, and let's talk about my family and future. So I would much rather we do it now with a uh, bottle of champagne and a 529 plan. <laughs> Keith, thanks very much. <laughs> you bet, Rick. 
Which of these factors determine whether or not you can deduct an IRA contribution? Your marital status, your income, whether or not you or your spouse is eligible to participate in a retirement plan at work, or is it all of the above? The answer is coming up. At a recent conference, investment advisors were asked just one question. What did they think of life settlements? They can work in, in certain situations, but not in all. A life settlement's an opportunity to sell back a life insurance policy prior to death so that you get the cash today. Uh, I don't like life settlements. <laughs> I think the industry is full of uh, opportunities for charlatanism. Not a fan of life settlements at all. It's kind of making a, a bet on someone else's death. It's a little, a little morbid. I think they're morbid, and I also th don't think they accomplish what people think they'll accomplish. The fact is that a tax deduction for an IRA contribution depends on all three factors, your marital status, your income, and whether you or your spouse is eligible to participate in a retirement plan at work. So the answer is all of the above. We're heading off to Virginia. Richard, welcome to the show. How are you? Hi, good. Thank you, and thanks for taking my call. Our pleasure. Um, a question. I have a 20-year-old daughter in college and trying to start building her good credit. Uh, we've applied for a couple of credit cards, or she has, and been turned down. And just wondering if you had any suggestions. Yeah, you got to love credit card companies. They only lend money to people who don't need it. Uh, <laughs> and so your, your daughter has no credit record, and therefore the credit card company has no idea whether or not she'll repay the loan. So the only way to get her a credit card is to get her credit. But the only way to get her credit is to get the credit card. I mean, it's a vicious cycle. So here's how you fix it. There are two choices that you have, Richard. Number one is for you to co-sign the loan. Whether it's a student loan, a car loan, or a credit card, if you co-sign it, she will qualify because you're now on the hook with her. So you okay. need to ask yourself, how confident are you that your daughter will, in fact, pay the bills every month on time? Because if she doesn't, your credit record is subject to a problem. So right. you need to have a real serious heart-to-heart -heart with your daughter if, to see if you're willing to put your name on the dotted line along with her. And that could lead to a second choice, which might even be the better option. A little bit more expensive, a little bit more limiting, but in the end, a better option. It's called a secured credit card. Here's how it works. Your daughter can't qualify for credit because the credit card company isn't sure that, they'll, that she's going to repay them if they lend, let her use it and lend money. So what, here's how it works. Your daughter sends the credit card company $500 in cash right now. They, in turn, give her a credit card with, guess what, a $500 credit limit. And this is why they're willing to give her the card, because she's <laughs> prepaid it. Therefore, right. they don't have any risk. So they give her a credit card, $500 limit, she uses the card, she gets a regular monthly bill, and she makes the regular monthly payments. That is how she establishes the track record of a good credit history, that she pays her bills on time, she never misses a payment, she never bounces a check, she's never late on a payment. And over time, they'll give her the $500 back as they treat her as a regular credit card customer. Okay. So one of Excellent. those two choices. Yeah. Uh, we've already gone down the first choice, and we're in that now, and, and she's paid the, the payments on time. So after a period of time, then, of me on a co-signed credit card, would she then um, have a credit rating? Or? Yes, yes. Yeah. Over time, as she demonstrates a track record of paying her bills on time and so on, she will develop her own credit history, and that will enable her to get approved for a credit card on her own. When that happens, you close the credit card account that has you tied to it. Okay, great. That's I really it. appreciate it. That's very helpful. Our pleasure, Richard. Thank you so much. Uh, money's a weird thing. You know the number one thing that couples fight about? What's that smell? Number two? <laughs> money. And you think those two things would overlap, but they never do. It, the smell is never money. That's all. I'm married. We have, uh, my wife and I, we, we're like everyone. We fight about money all the time. My wife has a very 
poor fundamental understanding of some very basic investment principles. You know, I will say to her, at our age, it is appropriate to have a high risk investment portfolio. And she will say to me, stop playing online poker. Uh, <laughs> as though there was a faster way for me to pay down $30,000 in credit card debts. Just come on. For those people that may be looking for a financial advisor, can you advise on, on what you should be looking for? The days of picking investments are over. Uh, for most Americans, we are now picking the investment advisor. We realize that it's very difficult, very confusing, very time consuming, and beyond our individual abilities. And this is why we need to turn to an advisor to assist us dealing with the, today's complexities. On our website at thetruthaboutmoneytv.com, I post the 18 questions that you should ask a prospective advisor with the answers you should hear from that advisor. Uh, here are a few of them. You can go get the information for free uh, at uh, thetruthaboutmoneytv.com. But here's a few of the, um, inf uh, of the items you'll see there. First, ask what services they provide. Make sure that the services they provide are the services you need, because different investment advisors specialize in different aspects of the financial world. Some do estate planning, some do investments, some do financial planning, some do managed money, some deal only with certain kinds of people, such as business executives, or widows, or retirees, or military. So you want to know what are the services they provide and who are the kind of people they provide them to. Make sure that what they do and who they do it for is similar to your situation. Second. How do they get compensated? This is something you should ask up front. Don't be embarrassed about asking. They shouldn't be embarrassed about answering. In fact, financial advisors, if they are in fact a registered investment advisor, are required by law to give you a written document called Form ADV, which is a disclosure document that lists their services, their background, their methodology, and their fee schedule. So ask them very clearly, how do you get compensated? Because advisors get paid in one of two ways. Commissions or fees? Commissions generally when you buy a product, an insurance product uh, uh, or an investment product. Fees are when the advisor is being paid by you for the advice that they're providing. Most consumers prefer an independent, objective, fee-based advisor, which avoids the risk of a conflict of interest. Because if you're dealing with a product-pushing, commission-based salesman, you have to raise the question, why is he telling me to buy that? Is it because he's going to make a lot of money selling it, or is it because I really ought to buy it? So a, a fee-based advisor is the preferential way uh, to go for most consumers. So ask those two questions. But one final point about the compensation. If you say, what do you get paid, you might only get half an answer. Because there's a difference between what they earn and what you pay. And here's what I mean. Advisors who charge a fee typically have a fee based on the amount of money you invest, 1% or 2% of the amount you invest. But in addition to the fee they earn, there will be costs of the investments you buy. So in addition to the advisor's fee is the fee of the investment. If you're going to buy mutual funds or exchange traded funds or hire a third party money manager or what have you, you're going to incur expenses to buy those investments in addition to the expenses of the advisor himself. So when you say, tell me your compensation, make sure your answer is all in. What is the total cost I'm going to incur, both your fee and the cost of the investments you're going to recommend? Otherwise, you might only get half an answer. He might say, oh yeah, the, my fee is 1%, without telling you that the investments cost another three on top of that. So make sure you get an all in uh, answer. And make sure they give you a copy of their form ADV. If they don't give it to you, it means they're not registered with the SEC or the state government. It means they are not a fee-based investment advisor, and you should take that into consideration. You need to interview two or three, because until you talk to a second advisor, you don't know if, if what the first advisor said makes any sense. It's like shopping for a car or a washing machine. Comparative shop so that you have a basis that you can compare with. A lot of this. You know, if I won the lottery, I wouldn't quit my job. You will be honest. Clap if you would quit your job to win the lottery. Of course you would. There's no two-week notice. There's a two-word notice. Bye-bye. 
I want a scratch off ticket for $5, I'm calling in sick. wondering how to have money left over after I'm done paying off all my student loans. I know what your situation is. You're young, getting started in your career, and you're not making a whole lot of money, and you got all these big bills, predominantly student loan payments, also some new rent and car payments and such, and you're saying to yourself, man, oh man, I can't wait until my income goes up, and I get rid of some of these bills, then I'm really going to be in good shape. Well, I got a warning for you. I have a lot of clients who are as broke on their $300,000 salaries as when they were only earning 30 grand. How can that be? Well, it's real simple. Their lifestyle today is an awful lot better than it was then. They're living in a really big house. They've got a closet full of clothes, lots of jewelry in the drawer, really nice cars in the driveway, fabulous vacations. I've seen people take the monthly car payment, three, four hundred dollars a month, suddenly they pay off the car, what do they do with the three or four hundred? They splurge on other expenses. Instead of taking the new found free cash flow and throwing it into savings and investments. That's the key. So don't allow your lifestyle to keep pace with your income or you'll always be broke. What percentage of U.S. college students receives financial aid? Is it 100%, 66%, 50%, or 33%? The answer is coming up later in the show. When I sat down to talk with Chaz Palminteri in Las Vegas on the set of his one-man play, A Bronx Tale, I thought we'd be talking about his career on stage and screen, the screenplays he's written, and even the secrets of his Baltimore restaurant. Well, we did talk about all that, but we also got into a passionate conversation about personal finance. Take a look. <laughs> A doo group sang right now in Hollywood there. Four guys, Carlo, Freddy, Angelo, and a guy named Dion. They got their name from the street sign. They were called Dion and the Belmonts, and they could sing better than anybody I ever heard. A lot of folks who are struggling uh, trying to make it in yes. Hollywood, um, either as a writer or, or as an actor, might not occur to them, uh, or even the not novelist wannabes, wouldn't occur mm. to them that, why don't I just write about my own life? Right, I mean, I, I had a very colorful uh, childhood, a great childhood. I've always said that. It wasn't a bad childhood. I mean, I did witness this murder and a few things, but I've had a great childhood growing up in the Bronx in the 60s and the late 50s and 60s, and so I'm, I'm very fortunate. Oh, it's one thing to write it. How did you manage to get it produced? I called a friend of mine who had money, and I asked him, I, I said, could you lend me, uh, at that time, $25,000? And he said, for what? I said, well, I want to do this. I wrote this play, and I don't have any money. And he said, well, let me think about it. I said, OK. And I thought he blew me off. The next day, I get a FedEx thing, a check of $25,000. That was a lot of money back then. And I said, how could you send me this? And he just said, you know, he said, I think you're a really talented guy. I just got faith in you. I saw you in a few plays uh, in New York. And I, I'm going to take a shot. My name is Cologio Lorenzo Alfredo Romano Palminteri. My mother is Rosina Cristina Maria Sofia Palminteri. My father is Lorenzo Giacomo Paolo Antonio Palminteri. Now, just ask yourselves one question. Are all these names necessary? The Bronx Tale mm. is uh, very well known as uh, an outstanding film. Robert De Niro uh, right. created that with you. But what is less known is that it was not originally a film. It was originally this. It was originally this. It was the show. The last offer I turned down was $1 million. And I had two... Just, just for the rights. Just for the rights of my play, because they were going to make it, an, you know, a big stars and put a Hollywood spin on it. And I refused. And I had $200 in the bank, my hand to God, if I'm lying to you. And they said, Robert De Niro just saw the show. He wants to talk to you in the dress room. I walked in the dress room. There was Bob De Niro. And he said, I just saw the show. It's unbelievable. It's one of the greatest shows I've ever seen. He goes, it's unbelievable. He goes, this will make a great movie. 
And I said, I know, Bob, but you, you don't understand. I have, he goes, I know, I know. I know what everybody's saying. You want to play Sonny. You want to write the screenplay. And he says, I'll tell you how I feel. You should play Sonny. And you should write the screenplay because it's about your life and it'll be real. He says, I'll play your father. I'll direct it. And you and I will go partners. And if you shake my hand, that's the way it'll be. I shook his hand. The rest is history. And that's the way it was. And that's the way it was. And in 1960, I was nine years old. Now, you've gone beyond uh, acting and writing and producing, both Broadway and in films. You now own a restaurant. I own a restaurant. I own a restaurant called Chaz, a Bronx original. You know, I... But it, wait, wait, wait. Chaz, a Bronx original, but it's in... Baltimore. <laughs> well, how did that happen? I'll tell you, I was on tour when I did the show, when I was in Baltimore, and I was looking for a great restaurant to eat on, and I couldn't find anything. I was literally, and finally I went into this place called Aldo's, and I loved it, and I met the owners there, two young uh, guys, and Aldo, who was the, the father, who was the chef and, and the owner, and I, we just became great friends, and we, we talked about opening up a restaurant a little more casual than, than Aldo's, but just kind of hip and, and pizza the way I used to have in the 50s and 60s, the coal fire oven, uh, you know, cooks in 90 seconds, the incredible food. And we talked about it for about a year, and then we just said, let's do it, and we did it. And now it was voted one of the top restaurants in Baltimore. Uh, before we go, I'm sure you've, you're very well familiar with all the horror stories of people in your yes. field who make a ton of money and lose it all, yes. either to scam or bad investments yes. or what have you. Talk about that. And the real key to keeping your money, Rick, is do not live above your means. Li always live under your means. The nut will break you every time. Meaning your minimum expenses. The that minimum you've got to expenses, pay. the expenses you have to pay. Now, I have a lot of stars, friends, bigger stars than me, huge, who I won't name, but have, who had five, six houses all over the world. They don't have them no more. And we sit, we have coffee, sometimes we talk, and they tell me why. They go, you know what, Jazz? It's too much. It's, it's just sending money out there, and after a while you get old and you go, what am I doing? Back down, back down, cut down, cut down. Spend cut down. less than you earn. Spend less than you earn, because then it gives you, it gives you independence. You could say, you know what, I don't want to do that, Jazz. It also lets you have, sleep easy at night, not worrying about where's the next money going to come it, from. Exactly. If I have to get a job because I have to pay for my home, my mortgage, or my cars, or my boat, I'm living too high, man. I'm living too high. You know, I don't want that. So you don't have to be a talented, award-winning financial advisor to give great financial advice. Spend less than you earn. That's Chaz. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks so much. Right, thank you. How many college students in the U.S. receive at least some financial aid? The answer? is 66%, or two out of every three U.S. college students. Before we go, a few thoughts on today's show. We heard a lot about giving. The friend who loaned Chaz Palminteri $25,000, the dad working to start his child off with a good credit rating, even the fact that two out of three college students get some sort of financial aid. We should always remember that there's a second part to that equation that the person who receives and gets that loan, that boost, that chance for a better life, well, it means you not only have a responsibility to repay the money, you also have a responsibility to take advantage of the opportunity you've been given to learn and create and succeed to the best of your ability. And that is the truth about money. I'm Rick Edelman. See you next week. <laughs>